So today's LinkedIn Live is on auditing fine grain entitlements for AWS. So to help us understand the importance of AWS auditing, this LinkedIn Live session proudly includes Shannon Noonan. Shannon is a noted security and privacy expert who has held positions like Director of Compliance at Silence and BlackBerry before venturing out on her own and is now CEO of her own GRC consulting firm, High Noon. Hi, Shannon. Hi, Ashley. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming. So other voices that you're going to hear are Kashif, he's our UATS Director of Deployments, Charles, our UATS Channel and MSP Director, and then of course Garrett, the CEO of UATS. So first, Shannon, please give the audience some more background on you and your experience in the cybersecurity and the GRC worlds. Um, as you noted, I ran a compliance department for a startup company. Um, in other terms or other areas, I've run an internal audit department. I've worked at the big four. I've done various uh, control and SOX testing, SOC 2 testing, you name the acronym, I've actually dealt with it. So uh, the GRC world is quite the place I live in. So first question goes to you, Shannon. So why is identity so important to cloud resources in particular into AWS? So identity in cloud resources or any resources is really a preventative control, right? You are preventing too much access or in other words, unauthorized access. So a lot of organizations will say least privilege or unauthorized access or authorized access. So identity management is key to be a preventative control and prevent users from getting into information, data or other means. For AWS, it's key. It's an area where people are using for storing data, for building out production environments, for just any type of um, data resources. So it's a very big area to make sure you've got the right controls in place. And what would you say the ramifications are for compliance and security if these entitlements are not managed correctly? Worst case scenario, which no one likes to say is a breach, right? You, If you have unauthorized access, it could lead to a potential breach. Um, and that's the, you know, the area nobody wants to say or talk about, but realistically access is how people get to data. And if you have unauthorized access it is considered a breach. So in your opinion, do most enterprises manage these privileges correctly? Depending on the environment, yes and no. Um, you have a lot of environments where they're very strict and they do have a rules-based uh, roles-based access and they control it and you have other areas where it's wide open so it just depends on the organization and the requirements they have to meet those that are more regulatory tend to have more controls in place but that doesn't mean they have controls in place everywhere aws is used for many many things as well as other environments right so aws can be used for backup storage it can be used for building out products it can be used for so many different avenues but if it's not in scope for audit is the access being reviewed? If it's not in scope for a regulatory requirement, is it being reviewed? So there's a slew of different avenues of um, what could come up. So would you say that enterprises should be constantly reviewing their AWS entitlements for security and compliance? Yes, yes. There should be at least a periodic review on an annual basis, depending on the rigor and the type of dating environment, it should be even more than that. Would you also agree that automation is key for reviewing AWS and other cloud entitlements? Yes, automation, having triggers for uh, privileged access, which could be anything from administrative to someone who has the ability to update uh, workflows. So yes, very, very important. So Garrett, what does you attest to to help out? I mean, thanks for uh, saying my name when you ask a question, because when Shannon starts talking, I literally just start taking notes. OK, so I'm in, I'm in note taking mode and I got all these notes like preventative control because she really knows her stuff. OK, and let me just go on top of that, of preventative control. OK, there's something that came out by the JRTF because, you know, Ashley didn't do, I mean, Ashley and, and Shannon didn't do enough acronyms yet. This is an IT call. Come on, guys. You know, joint the JRTF is a joint ransomware task force, which is the CISA, the NSA, the FBI said, you know, guys, we're getting hacked. So someone pulled their ears and said, come on, guys, come up with something that helps enterprises stop getting ransomware, or at least a guide to, to, to that, that they should 
best practices. And what do they come up with? Preventative controls. And one of the key preventative controls was what? Was the principle of least privilege documented in the JRTF Stop Ransomware Guide. It says straight out, what enterprises need to be doing is enforce the principle of least privilege. Everything Shannon was saying, the preventative control is we must understand all these, uh, these privileges and these rights that we've granted all these users. I just did a LinkedIn post today about static accounts. The people create these accounts, they have no idea. Two months, three months, four months down the line, we forgot that Bob have access. We forgot we gave this service uh, uh, account this privileges. We forgot of the, about these permission and entitlements. Watch what Kashif does later. And it goes to the keyboard and shows this, right? It quantifies all the privileges in a single GUI and allows the right manager to review. So to answer your question, Ashley, which I did a bad job of it, right? So we, we can't just be auditing macro access and being in identity management let me, for too many years, let me explain what I mean. It's not just, did we give you know single sign-on into AWS via or Okta via or something else, right? Nothing wrong with that. I love that stuff. What we have to do is we have to go inside and bury our heads deep, deep into the AWS IAM and get the root account information, get the user accounts, get the groups, and get the user permissions and policies on everything, EC2, S2, Lambda, et cetera. That's what we have to do. And that's what we've done at UATES. So Garrett, what is the benefit of UATES for AWS over just pulling the information directly from AWS? It, it, you know, my first blog that I ever wrote for UATES was, was the concept of single pane of glass, okay? Single pane of glass where all this information, nothing wrong with it, this is obviously amazing, right? But I could look anyone in the eye, and I have to say this all the time in the investors and other type of meetings, where I go, listen, the world of identity, no different than security either, is doers, guys that get things done, okay? Well, yeah, Ashley, you were with me when we built Secure Out from scratch, right? We're doing, we're building, we're building two-factor, we're building SSO, we're creating... Someone comes down the line and says, hey, by the way, for GRC, we need this information. And someone goes in the, in the product in a group, we got our product manager, goes, yeah, rock and roll. I'll, I'll put a little tab here and you can download the, that information and then do what the hell you want with it. That's literally what you got in not a bad way in most products and AWS is no different. You can get the information you are seeing in you attest manually. You can download the user groups, users. You can download the group permissions. You can download the, uh, the permission sets individually. So now you got a bunch of spreadsheets, rock and roll. Shannon, do you need more spreadsheets to look at? Right? No, no, I don't. <laughs> right. And Charles, do your partners need more spreadsheets to look at? No. They don't look at all the ones they have now. <laughs> That's a really good point. That is a good point. What UATES does is the single pane of glass for the risk manager, the person actually assigned, right? Shannon's working with someone and they're saying, hey, uh, guys, for the SOC report, we need, we need this information, not only condensed, but we need an attestation, an attestation. Remember, the first part is just getting the data. So rock and roll. AWS does a great job. You can download and you got a spreadsheet. That spreadsheet doesn't attest to itself. It just sits in some download folder that is, you know, in, 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 you know, right next to your pictures of your dog. It's not doing anything. You attest takes, yes, actually, you have the dog. Yes. Uh, um, it take, we, someone has to take that information and disperse it and get the right managers to approve. That's where you attest excels. Right, because not only does it take that information in automatically through our wonderful assembly connector. But what we do with that information is we tie those users to your IAM. And as Kashif is going to show you, we push out. We auto-delegate out to those managers and say, do you approve these rights? And then as Shannon will tell the company is, I want this done monthly or quarterly, right? And then we can auto-schedule those reviews. 
So that's the big differentiator. It's nothing wrong. The ADMS has the information, right? All right. What are you doing with that information? Attestation is not built in, into AWS, nor anyone else practically. So that's why we exist. So back to Shannon, um, since you have experience with the UATest platform, so would you say that UATest improves the key points to a cyber audit, accuracy and completeness around AWS resources? Yes, we've been, and we've been able to show that in some organizations because the key areas that we've had to do for audits, like a SOC 1 or Sarbanes-Oxley and other areas, we have to vet out completeness. So whether we're using spreadsheets or a tool in of itself, we have to vet out the completeness. So we're comparing before go live, the data that is in the environment source to you attest to verify that the information is there and that it's pulling the right information. Otherwise we wouldn't be able to rely on it because we can't get the auditors comfortable with it. And Charles, so are you attest MSP and channel partners? So how do you see this helping the channel and MSP community? Well, let's look at this a lot of different ways. The MSP, MSSP, anybody who's a service organization has customers, okay, they have to be proactive. That's that's why you're hired. You know, so MSPs who are, who are on and listening to me, this is why you guys are there, to be their proactive profession, to make sure that your clients are doing proper ID governance, proper cybersecurity from a proactive standpoint. Look, there's lots of products out there and you guys are all using them that take care of the issue once it's happened, I've been attacked. Where's my data? How do I get started again? You guys all have 10, 20, 50 applications that you're using. What you attest has done is given you the proactive approach to say, hey, let's keep them out to start with. So through the ID governance, so be their professional. And with our training, with this software, which is easily downloaded, okay, with our training, you become their professional. You become the guy who points them in the right direction says, look, this manager's got to take care of his group and this group's got to take care of that group. And when you get it all done, we'll have a report ready for you. As an MSP, that's what you're being hired to do. And we make it really easy and inexpensive for you to do that. So there's revenue to be made, reasonable, and you get to be the professional, the, the professional MSP. You get to bring something to the table that not a lot of guys are doing. And most lack a tool like this today, right? Without a doubt. Uh, it, it's, it's one of the reasons we're getting really great feedback from the MSPs we are talking to. And there's more and more every day. Uh, without a doubt, um, not a lot have been proactive. Everybody has spent, as I said earlier, everyone has spent so much time worrying about, well, they're already in, now what do I do? And it was pointed out to me um, months ago by one of, one of my old partners, who pointed out once they're in, they're in and they'll hide. Well, they can't hide if one, you've kept them out, you've been proactive about it. And two, if you do regular attestations, you're constantly looking at who's in, making sure there's no, no creep, right? No application creep, which we, we haven't talked about today, but that's a big issue. I was with a company, I was a sales guy. I had access to our finances. That's not an application I should have been able to get into, right? Application creep. I had access to it once and nobody ever took it away from me. So these are the things, you MSPs that are out there that are listening in, these are the things you get to do for your clients by doing, by being on the proactive side of protecting them. Yes, you have to have the reactive softwares. You have to have the reactive applications without a doubt. The, the, cybersecurity storage protection softwares, all those pieces, you have to have those as part of your go-to-market plan, as part of your quiver of arrows, as it were. But you need to be proactive, especially in today's world, where the black hats are finding 18 different ways from Tuesday how to get in. And what's it? what was the number, Garrett? Over 70% of access today by the black hats is through identification yeah. theft. So yeah. what do you do? You use you a test. Yeah. You use some piece of software, us, if you can find somebody better, go for it. But I don't think there is. But you have to use something that you can be proactive with. Keep them out. That's the key. That is the true key to protecting your company, protecting your clients. Keep them out. 
And, and one other number that was amazing, Palo Alto Unit 42 oh, yeah. did, a, did a survey of 1,800 customers. I love Palo Alto. It's a great survey. And they said they looked over their permissions in their cloud. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking to AWS privileges. They didn't say 70, they didn't say 80, they didn't say 90. It said 99% of the companies have user permissions overly permissive. The analogy we like to make here at UNTS is, is the cars, is, is after World War II. And watch this. You have the greatest engines in the world, you know, piston engines ever made. And they threw them in these damn planes and they flew them over Europe and did stuff. Okay. They took those engines and that technology and then they came back and built cars. Okay. Put them in cars. The same type of technology. Those things were fast. My brothers were big GM guys. Uh, 454, Oldsmobile's rockets, that kind of stuff. Those things were fast. Yeah, Charles, you know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, what Our the guy. hell did they put in the brakes? The brakes were drum brakes in the 40s and 50s. So they're taking these damn things into walls and into each other. They're killing each other all over the highways, okay? What needed to be put on? We needed to come up with disc brakes and other technologies. That's where IGA is, guys. IMs are fantastic. They really are. I'm a big fan of Okta, Jump Cloud, Ping, uh, Azure AD. They've done a great job. And then the provisioning tools are fantastic. But what about those privileges? One month after, two months after, three months. As Charles was saying, those are stale accounts, you know, They're not used or whatever. And what Kashif is going to show you is not only do we need to review, we're, 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 we're pulling the security information. We're pulling whether it has two-factor. When's the last time you changed password? And what's relevant is also, what's the latency? When's the last time this person's logged in? All good. Take it away, Ashley. Thank you. So Charles, back to you. So what about the skill set required for your MSPs or channel partners to use you test? Well, this is the really nice thing. Um, being the sales weenie that I am, even a sales guy can do it, okay? Simple, gooey basic, like no left, Shannon. Go easy GUI based design, 100%. I'm not laughing. No I, I, I'm, I'm in agreement. <laughs> <laughs> no, right? No code solution. All the work's done by the UATest, the UATest agent, whether it's in AWS, Azure, whatever, whatever it happens to be, but it's all done via the agent. Um, we take time to train our partners. As I said earlier, training is accomplished in a couple of hours. Okay. Uh, makes the MSP or the integration part, partner fully proficient. And we have both. We work with integration partners. We work with MSPs. If you've got an, if you have a field engineer who's worth half his, you know, half his weight, he's going to be able to do this with his eyes closed. It's really simple to use. Like I said, sales guy, I can do it. Okay. Part of the training, as we always make sure that if you are going to utilize this product for your customers, that we're going to make sure you download it for yourself. And make sure you have access to it. So you can always practice. There's always a POC access for you as an MSP. So we make sure you're able to do that. Um, I was on a customer call this morning and it was their annual, you know, their, their annual or quarterly review with us. And they're thrilled with how things work. And this is the customer. You know, they've been trained by Kasha. So, you know, with that, I'm going to pass it back to Ashley, pass it back to Kasha. And you guys get to see how easy this really is and how much information we've put out there on the dashboard. Before we do that, I have a couple more questions. Um, so Shannon, in your experience, I assume that all GRC tools are not that easily installable and usable, right? Yes, you are correct. And we're not going to name names because that's not the game. <laughs> but um, yeah, the, it can be complicated. It can be simple, but you it just depends on the environment and your knowledge. So Garrett, what do you see out there in the competitive landscape for GRC? You know, and that's interesting. And it's a great question because actually you, you and I were once joined at the hip when we were doing two-factor. And that's a real, I call it the space lease sprocket world. You suck. No, you suck more. You know what I mean? That's that's two-factor. It's 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 nasty. You know, we're better. We're GRC, worse helping companies. When Charles is talking with, Kashif is talking with, we're taking people from spreadsheets. That's the number one you know, competitor. The competitor is changing the way people are doing it and showing that we have automated the process. 
And I would have to say GRC people are much more collaborative than security people. Security people are start and combative and, and then work backwards. We're, well, in our meetings, what we're doing is we're saying, listen, you got the SOX compliance. You got the SOC 2. You've got serious security problems, okay? We've got to work on who has access to what. And downloading the spreadsheet and figuring out who the manager is and oh, come on, rock and roll. Let's automate. Let's make your life better. So the competitive landscape, Ashley, is, yeah, the, the, the top 2 3% have some really good uh, uh, tools out there. But those things take 18 months to deploy and just aren't relevant for companies under 5,000 users. Okay, they're just not. Whereas we can walk in and we've done the big accounts, but we can walk in someone's environment, we can get it integrated in an hour and we can have you coming up with your audits in a week. Okay, and that's real time, real real experience. Kashif has done it in, in, a, in a session. He's deployed it to three different uh, um, um, IAMs in, in an hour and 15 minutes and has got this working for people. Okay, so the competitive landscape is what? It's mostly changing what people are doing for process because when Shannon goes to an account, they have something that they're doing and she's giving a high level and saying, doing this, they need to go and do automation. Yes. So I'm sure the audience is chomping at the bit to see it. So Kashif, can you run a demo of you test with AWS? Sure thing. Thanks, Ashley. And Thank let me know you. when you can see my screen. We see it. Great. So this is the dashboard, you test dashboard. I mean, among other things, uh, you can integrate with one of your IAM identity stores. But once you do that, we have the AWS connector built into this. And let me just show you quickly how we can pull the information from your AWS environment. All you have to do is create audit, select the time frame that you need to complete the audit within this time frame, this window, and then select the resource. Among others, we have AWS integration already um, integrated with this tenant of mine. I'll just go and select that. The next thing you see, you have a choice to pull the, you know, the, uh, the root account, the root user that was used to create the AWS account um, in the beginning. And then you can decide whether you want to do active or inactive, or you want to see all the users that have access to AWS. And then you select the type of the audit. Well, do you want to fetch the groups assigned to the users inside AWS? Or you want to fetch all the permissions and policies assigned to those users inside AWS or both? So if that's the case, you just go ahead and submit and now the system is, since it's connected to your AWS environment, it's going to pull that information in real time and show it to you in this format. Now, please notice you see the root account, you see, you will see, you know, the details and anything uh, particular to that root account, including the last activity, including the last login, but you will you know, these accounts will be flagged if any of the three conditions or any of the three parameters for example, if you see the last activity was 45 days ago, the UATest tool will flag that and will show you uh, th this, this 40, 45 day mark that you need to look into this, why there has been no activity for 45 days in this account. Or if your MFA has been disabled, the UATest tool will flag that user just for you to look into why the MFA is disabled for this account for this user. Or if the password age has passed, let's say 40 days or 50 days, whatever is the, you know, the set, you know, a benchmark in there, if it passed that limit, that it will flag the flag the user for you to see and look into the information and see what you can do about it. So these any of these three or all of them, if they exist, we will flag the account for you. Coming to the details, it will pull the information of the user, the group he's part of, the policy and permission he has inside AWS. So you can go granular and check one if you want to certify or revoke the access to a group, to a permission. And then, you know, you can, you can choose which one you want to certify, which one you want to revoke the access for. There could be multiple. These are just showing up, you know, these, these three over here, but you, 
AWS has like over 200 different services and different, you know, permissions or maybe more, which can be shown over here as long as they're part of uh, AWS environment. So once you have those, you can decide which one you would like to assign, which one do you, would you like to revoke or certify for that particular user? So it goes in, you know, in detail inside there, but I just want to show you this one here, this account. It has not been flagged. Why? Because of the last activity, that was one day ago. MFA has been enabled, so no flagging. The password age is 38 days ago, so it hasn't reached that 40 or 50 day mark. So there is no flagging. So this account is good. But the rest of these accounts, you need to look into. On top of that, if you're your test tenant is integrated with one of your identity source, for example, if it's Microsoft Azure, or if it's Okta or anything, any IAM that you're using, and you, you have any greater you attest with that tool, with that IAM, you can fetch the current managers for these identities that you have inside AWS. Once you have the managers, once you have their supervisors they're reporting to, it's really easy for you to delegate to those managers, asking them to review their access and, and market by either certifying or revoking the access of these users to a particular group or permission or policy. So you can do that from within your test easily. And once you're done, when you have completed the audit, you have reviewed everything inside AWS, this is the final evidence you will get either in PDF or in CSV format, showing you everything that user has inside AWS and the actions performed by their managers or the reviewers uh, for AWS account, and you can present that to your auditors, showing the you know whole digital trail. So that's about it. Over to you, Ashley or um, Garrett, if there is any question or you would like me to explain further. No, that, that, was, that was great. I think we wet the whistle and and uh, we uh, talked directly to the customers and 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 show them that what we can do. That was great. And and, and team, what's really important if you're to see is how straightforward that was. It really is. We want to simplify the GRC process. Thank you, Kashif. Take it away, Ashley. Perfect. Thanks, Kashif. Um, so we have some direct questions, so I'm going to direct them over to the panel. So first one goes to Shannon. So where do you see AWS audits, audits more relevant? What guidances or regulations? So again, it just depends on what it's being used for. So if it is storing an application, it could be a SOC 1. If it's where you're building your environment, it could be FedRAMP, PCI, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley. So there's, it just all depends on what the scope is. So PCI is credit card. So if you have credit card numbers that are being stored in the environment, that would be in scope. If you have any um, data, federal data, or what they call CUI data, in your GovCloud instance or in a uh, FedRAMP moderate account instance, that would be a FedRAMP audit. Um, if it's in scope for, say, your SOC 1 or SOC 2, that would be in, so in scope. So it just all depends on what the regulatory requirement is and what the need is. The other area is it just AWS stores data. So if we think of it, if it's got financial data, if it's got healthcare data, if it's got privacy data, <laughs> federal data, it's going to have a regulatory requirement attached to it. And Charles, do you see MSPs taking on more governances? Without a doubt, um, without a doubt, because it is such a big topic right now, because of the latest push by the government, you know, the the, the laws, the SOCs and so forth have been in, they've been in, in enacted a long time ago, but there was always a question of how to, um, how to actually govern, you know, how to actually put these things into use. And it's only recently where the government is saying, okay, you have to do these things. The insurance companies are saying, you have to do this if you want cyber security insurance. And so from an MSP perspective, they have to take on this ID governance piece or they're no good to their customers. And that's, I think that's just the bottom line of all of this is you have to expand your capabilities to hold on to your customers. This is a way to do it. And Shannon, do you see AWS audits relevant to CMMC? Yes, very much so. Um, especially if you're storing any uh, federal data, such as CUI data. Garrett, what is the frequency our customers do these access reviews? 
I answer that, but I want to channel to go on top what she recommends. Because actually, you know, when we started this, people mm-hmm. were like, you know, like three years ago, they were like, okay, we'll uh, we'll do this socks review once a year. You know what I mean? And then as we saw is that people are doing socks and they'll do a sock, then they'll do a HIPAA, then they'll do whatever. So we have our customers doing these at least quarterly and then admin accounts. I'm seeing more and more monthly. And what's your guidance on this, Shannon? Pretty much the same. So uh, PCI requires quarterly reviews. Sarbanes-Oxley doesn't have a specific requirement, but it's on a periodic basis. So that's on at least annual. But as it becomes riskier, you're seeing everything from about a month uh, reviews every month to quarterlies to semi-annuals and annuals. So it just depends on the regulation and the risk. But I'm definitely seeing more more environments with quarterly reviews and the riskier areas such as administrative access being monthly. I have a question. So we've been talking a lot about the U.S. versions of requirements. What about the European version? What about GDPR? What about, um, I, was it ISO 27001, whatever that is? And, and what about uh, NIS, um, which are all being looked at by outside the country, Australia, New Zealand, the EU. Um, how do we fit in there, Garrett? Well, first of all, I mean, uh, the, Shannon can tell us that obviously they, they have the same type of user access reviews because we've got customers in Switzerland and England and the uh, Benelux. Um, so they're all under EU and GDPR and they're mostly under ISO 27001. So they use us there. And of course, we are hosted in our fine friends in Europe. So the GDPR is uh, conditions are met where and the data does not leave. Dan, do you know from, from the perspective of what Garrett just said, how often they have to do this over in Europe and, and outside this country? It's going to be the same. So, but GDPR doesn't have a specific timeline, right? It's a law. So it's not going to say explicitly how often, but you do need to have define who can have access to the data. So that goes into a rules-based approach and making sure you've got least privileged, right? So you do have to define the, the business reason and the why's they need this access, right? Whereas like ISO 27001, it's going to be like all the other frameworks. You've got to do it at least periodically and quarterly um, quarterly basis. So uh, it's all about risk at that point. And then as you get into the federal programs, they're just like our FedRAMP CMMC requirements. They're, the higher risk, the more you have to review, the less risk, the quarterly type annual reviews that have to be done. And I asked the question for a reason, you guys, because we've just signed up and, and added new MSPs outside the country. So I want them to understand this will work for you too. I mean, you're all concerned about it. Um, it's, that's that's the biggest piece of my conversations with guys outside the country is how is this going to help them? And thank you for answering that question. So I didn't have to for them. <laughs> Perfect. I think we can wrap this up. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, so Shannon, how can people get a hold of you? People can get a hold of me. Oh, what's the best way? So you can reach me at um, Shannon at HNTC.io and we'll go from there. Awesome. Perfect. And Charles, do you have anything to add to the channel MSP professionals out here? Reach out to me. You all have my email address, or you can reach out at partners at uattest.com and um, give me a call. Perfect. And everyone else, you can contact us at info at uattest.com and we'll address all your cloud and on premise identity auditing needs. Thank you. And thank you so much, Shannon, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks Ashley. Steph. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.